Hi, this is David Gronoski, host of A Neighbor's Choice and Things Hidden Podcast, as well as some of our other programs like Science and You with our Chief Science Advisor, Dr. You, and our Seed Oil Survival Series that we continue to have great fun unpacking the truth of nutrition. I wanted to give you a quick little message saying that we appreciate all the support that we get from our monthly contributors and our one-time donation supporters, and we'd encourage all of you to go to our website, neighborschoice.com, click on Contribute, and make a monthly pledge today, whether it's a dollar, five dollars, fifteen, twenty, fifty, whatever you want to do, doesn't matter. Just be a part of building this new media project that we've developed to empower and inform, to inspire, to kickstart a scientific renaissance, an anthropological breakthrough and reformation in the church. All these things are possible with your support right now. So make that commitment today and help us keep doing the productions that we have. Thank you. Well, today we have a special program in store. You have not seen him for some time on our show, but he has been quite busy behind the scenes doing what he does to develop an understanding of the physical world that will revolutionize the world and is revolutionizing the world as we speak. And that is our chief science advisor, Dr. Yu. How you doing? Hi, David. So I'm doing very well. Uh, thank you. So happy yeah, to I was, see you again. I was just talking to uh, one of the most prominent doctors, uh, Dr. McCullough, who was big during the pandemic. He was. He still has the highest rated podcast for Rogan of any guest that's ever been on Joe Rogan's show, which is the number one rated podcast. So that's a pretty, pretty big achievement given the fact yes. that Rogan has people like Hulk Hogan and Hollywood stars every day, you know, he still got the number one, I believe. So I, I credited you because it was in March, 2020, you went on live radio news radio, WFLA Orlando and said, when that pandemic was first starting, you said, Hey, z -Pack. everybody, I'm not a doctor, but from my understanding, z -Pack is going to be something you might want to take a look at and get talk to your doctor about, as this was March 2020, when no one knew anything about the pandemic, and there was a little bit of data online that people were using z -Pack around the country, around the planet in France and places for this new mysterious uh, illness that no one knew what to do with. But you were early on that, and he uses that in his protocol for millions of people have been using this So uh, for that illness. So I just want you to know that you were early on that, and that is a testament to the explanatory power of, of Dr. Yu's insights. Even though he is a physicist and an engineer, he is also someone who is a systems thinker, and those are rare to find those people today systems thinker, people who can look outside the box and connect data. One of the other things that Dr. Yu, I mean, he's predicted a lot in physics and we can, we'd have to do another show on that to, to encapsulate all the news stories we've done together over the years for years, uh, nightly radio broadcasts. And I would always surprise him with uh, science news, whether it's about asteroids or comets and the shape of them, you know, you predicted some of these things or whether it's the magnetism of the earth or, how atoms are working or how energy would be working and so forth and so on. So many predictions that he's made on radio and on the podcast that have then borne fruit when we saw new evidence and new, um, you know, studies come out that prove and suggest that he was correct about some of his explanations of the world. And one of them that also comes to mind was when I asked you one time, well, if your model of physics is correct, Dr. Yu's Yuan theory, which is that every particle is a magnetic particle with both positive and negative poles, and that that is the makeup building block for all the different forces, all the different laws, all the different uh, phenomena in the universe that we know. Um, I said, if that's correct, how would we rethink what we would do with something like cancer? How would we deal with that? And you suggested just from first principles, understanding the magnetic nature of particles, including the magnetic particles in our body and the magnetic nature of something like an antibiotic, you suggested, I think people should look into antibiotics like z and others. We're not sponsored by that. That's a generic drug. So there's no 
<laughs> company that has a patent on that anymore, which is why it's not so popular in the media anymore. But uh, you said, I think people should look into antibiotics and you explained the mechanism of how you thought that antibiotics worked in the body and how cancer worked on a physics level. And I went and looked up and I found the world's most, one of the most cited cancer researchers in the world, Michael Lasanti, out of the Salford University in England, who's, he's an American. He went for, he was in Thomas Jefferson University and other places in America before he went to Salford University where he's doing just that to this day using, and we've had him on the show uh, to talk about it, but he's using things like doxycycline and azithromycin and other things to deal with stem cells, cancer stem cells, and the metastatic nature that they are uh, given in the body to do tremendous um, research with that. It's just amazing. And you knew that as a physicist. And that doesn't mean Dr. No, Dr. Yu knows everything, but that means when you get something that's really true about the world, there's a lot of staggering implications that are downstream from that discovery, right? Thank you for recognizing that. That was uh, five years ago, I guess, before pandemic, right? Yeah, the, the cancer one was, yeah, that was, uh, that that prediction was back in, yeah, at least five, if not six. Oh, I would say, no, early. that's back in... The cancer prediction you gave to me probably around 2017, 2018. Yes, that, that, that's a long time ago. And, yes. that, and, 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 and Lasanti's work has been in using antibiotics in that field of oncology for longer than that period. But we, he, neither he nor I knew, well, you know, neither of us had known about his work using antibiotics to treat this, this issue. Um, prior to his prediction that that would be something to look into. Yeah, he's a pioneer. And uh, we, we knew him uh, during pandemic, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. that's uh, amazing. He did a lot of amazing work. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he did stuff on during the pandemic for that too. I, I wanted to have you on today because um, we have a milestone uh, December 17th, which has passed us now, but it's not too long ago. Uh, so we're still celebrating the 120-year anniversary of the Wright brothers and their success at their inaugural flight. This has happened on December 17, 1903. According to earthsky.org, they, they tell it this way, that 120 years ago, two Ohio brothers, Wilbur and Orville Wright, made the first bona fide manned-controlled heavier-than-air flight it was the first airplane, and it took off at 10.30 a.m. with Orville Wright on board as pilot. He flew their vehicle, called the flyer, for 12 seconds over 40 yards of sandy ground just outside Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The Wright brothers succeeded where numerous other talented visionaries failed. Two years later, the Wrights wrote in a patent application that their airplane design quote, provides means for guiding the machine both vertically and horizontally, combining lightness, strength, convenience of construction, and certain other advantages. So let's just start there. Dr. Yu, this is a, a great milestone. And I thought since you are who you are as a physicist and engineer, maybe you could weigh in with your thoughts. Um, this is a, a remarkable achievement 120 years ago. Yeah, by the Wright brothers. Uh, if you think back at that time, you cannot fly anything heavier than air, right? But, uh, you know, uh, there's another uh, phenomenon. You see birds and uh, uh, ducks, chickens, they have their wings. And if this, they really demonstrate that actually uh, could fly heavier on the air. Uh, I believe they have a strong belief. So if those things can fly, and the human should be. And the only thing we miss is we don't have a wings, right? Yeah. So they built a wind uh, vehicle. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a remarkable. And that's kick off our entire airline industry and revolutionize the, uh, the traveling, uh, transportation method. Just back to the Wright brothers for a second. They, it says that their father gave them a rubber band powered flying toy when they were still children. 
The toy was made of cork and bamboo with a paper body. By 1899, when Wilbur was 33 years old and Orville was 28, the brothers were already learning everything they could about the science of aeronautics and the history of attempted human flight. Their first airplanes were gliders, which they tested on a long, isolated beach in, in near Kitty Fox. In 1902, they had built a glider that could be manned and controlled by a human pilot. It held a world record for gliding over 200 yards. Their first powered aircraft had a little over a 40-foot wingspan, weighing 750 pounds, and had a 12-horsepower engine. That first flight in December 1903 marked the beginning of a new era of global travel and interrelatedness. Um, by the time they received their patent for their airplane in 1906, several other aviators of the day claimed to have been the first to use the Wright's method of turning the airplane by warping or twisting the wings. But this part of the design, too, was included in the Wright's patent. I have their biography, and it talks about how they were they were bicyclists. They they made bicycles and they sold bicycles, so that's how they got started. And it just goes to show sometimes you got to walk before you run, or in other words, you have to cycle before you fly. Um, but you know, here 120 years later, you said we've we we have had advancements for sure, but structurally the same paradigm of travel is still in place, is it not? Uh, that's right. Um, for airplane flight, we use the exact the same principle. With rockets, a little different, right? Now, fuel and it's an ignition engine. You're still having to work against gravity. You're still having to work. Yes, against work. Yeah. Still, still rely work against gravity and try to lift off of the ground. Uh, so I believe we can do even better than a lot of recent news talking about the UAP, right? Unidentified aerial phenomenon. Right. Uh, in in the old days, you know, we used to call UFO phenomenon. Right. And there's so many evidence and the radar and a lot of it detected using modern technology. And I believe uh, these the fundamental principle exist. If we can at this time make anti gravity propulsion system work. So let's get into that. So you're you're saying that, and this is something I've been talking about on my show, and we've been talking about this for years, and with different folks, these unidentified aerial phenomena called UFOs. Originally, we don't know all the different, um, you know, the different reports credibility, but there seems to be enough credible reports that suggest something as real. You know, that's that's demonstrating strange behavior without. What are some of the characteristics we've had on some of the, uh, a couple, you know, like Sean Cahill, who was a noted uh, naval master at arms. Uh, you know, he was on the USS Nimitz, I believe, who saw these these aerial phenomenon, little tic-tac looking objects circling right. ar yep. around the naval ship. And then they went into the water and then they went back up in the air and just totally beyond the capabilities of anything that the that we know of that humans have made and yet we're going to avoid the topic of where those things come from and focus on the physics of these things so what are what are some of the characteristics they say they don't have any heat trail they don't have any noticeable can you explain what they're talking about what are what, what are they what are some of the characteristics of these objects one thing is they do not have a apparent propulsion system. You know, in order for now, we have to at least have an exhaust system of a vehicle, space vehicle fly in space, right? Exhaust eject the matter mass, uh, you know, at high velocity. Uh, that's created a, a reaction force for you to fly. So that's yeah. the, that's now that's the only method right now we have for our space flight. So number one, they do not see. Uh, and the exhaust system imply they do not have a, the current uh, propulsion system we have. So that's something. The second thing is traveling at an extraordinary uh, acceleration. So it could be even the hundreds of Gs. So which beyond uh, any uh, biological human beings' uh, physical limit for uh, astronauts to not to lose uh, consciousness, you know, during flight out, you know, it's limited about uh, like six Gs and uh, no more than nine Gs. 
in otherwise you will totally pass out and uh, and for airplane for you know for a uh, structure limit it also have a limit if uh, faster than that one like f16 faster than certain g's um and and the wind will come off in the current f- phenomena we see ex- extremely acceleration uh and no earthly uh, propulsion system can have that kind of power. Of course, unless you have a different type of propulsion, have a so-called anti-gravity uh, propulsion. So it, but you still, even though, and and it's, it would be an order a significant advancement, but you still would have to limit the G's that they take if, if you're taking humans on a ride to Jupiter, right? That that is a limit, in your opinion, that. Uh, theoretical anti-gravity propulsion would not overcome that, right? We can gradually accelerate. You know, we cannot instantly accelerate at the high G's, right? But as we just give it a little bit of time. Gradually, say, if we limited like a 6 G's acceleration, instead of use a second, right, we use an hour. So what kind of 6 G's use an hour? So what that speed is? So we can reach the high speed uh, even nearby the speed of light by gradually, gradually, uh, you know, uh, acceleration. Let's go back to the fundamentals. Why do you believe that, uh, why do you believe anti-gravity propulsion is theoretically possible? I want to demonstrate to your audience why I believe it is real and how we can move forward to make this one work. Okay, so you're going to demonstrate how anti-gravity yes. is a real phenomenon. What you're saying is that there's no good explanation using current paradigms of physics to explain believed to be UFOs. So there's nothing out there that's that's compelling, but there is something that explains it, whether there's UFOs or not, that this is a real phenomenon, right? Yes. I'm going to put a... a... Conclusion first. Number one, I do believe those those phenomena, UAP or UFO phenomena, could exist. Anti gravity propulsion probably is the only choice to make it work. Okay, so now I try to explain uh, what the interaction between the sun versus planets. Okay, I'm using this uh, red ball, represent the sun. And I use this small ball, represent the planets. Gravity is the only attraction force between, between the centers of, of different masses. Okay. If that's the gravity attraction between the sun and the earth, you, what happens if, if the earth nearby the sun? It will be in by attraction to the sun. So then we were burned off. The reason we are not burning off is because the solar system is not a stationary, it's a rotating. So that means the sun and the earth in- interaction, not just because they have attraction force, also they're rotating, create a centrifugal force, counter counterbalance of the attraction force. If you do an uh, experiment, you know, a numerical experiment, you just do say, hey, center to center attraction between the sun and the earth, the earth is not going to rotate with the sun. It's not going to rotate. So what force make things rotate? So what force? So I'm demonstrating with this battery and magnets. And I put a battery connected with magnets. And then I have a, a conducting uh, coil. And let's see what happens if I put this one on. Did you see if we have a electricity and the magnets, it can create the force. It can make things rotate. That's the integrated force for solar system to work. So now let's explain the phenomena I just demonstrated. So that phenomena demonstrated for solar system to work, just attraction is itself not enough. You have to make the entire solar system rotate, make all the system rotate with you. And the water force can make them rotate with you. I said, if you need to have electricity, you need to have magnets, and when they are interact, then we created this moving system. So this is demonstrated the solar system operate under electromagnetic force. 
So this is another demonstration of, of if we have a battery and with magnets, and we can make a motion, we can create a motion. Let's try again. So that's one of the uh, reason we see all the objects in space, always in motion. Never see something uh, stationary, right? So that establishes that we don't really need gravity. The gravity was something that came, that was a mistake, a mistaken assumption, right? Yes. Based on the, my research find, find uh, gravity is actually just uh, magnetic attraction. The attraction force we, we observed between Earth and the Sun and between solar system and the galaxies, actually those so, those attraction is not due to Newtonian gravity. It's actually it's a magnetic attractions. However, we do find one thing about a uh, problem with uh, Newtonian uh, gravitational force. We said everything only attract, all matter on attract, and never mentioned about the matter repel. Uh, that's not the true. If everything only uh, uh, attract, you know what happens? All the universe, all the objects eventually under attraction for the world eventually gradually will come all come together, become one object. At this whole universe actually is expanding and also accelerating expanding. And that's created another mystery in physics. Still unsolved the problem, say, hey, where comes this force pushing them away, right? Somebody called this is called dark energy. So some energy pushing them away. Of course, what is energy? And there's also force acting something, you know, uh, over over distance, right? So that means you have to have a force. Why is magnetic force creating a kind of attraction uh, and, and, repulsion. and repulsion in the centrifugal force at the solar system level, but at the universe level, it's all flying apart? Let me first explain what to make things fly away from each other. Uh, I have a strong magnet inside of this called uh, the leaning tower of pizza, okay? Uh, the reason I'm, I'm put inside because this magnet, if I hold these strong magnets on my hand, you would see my uh, hands will turn red because it clogged the uh, bloodstream, okay? And you will feel itching and pain. And so now I try to ex explain what force makes things fly away from each other. In order for something fly away and ac at acceleration, so that means fly faster, faster, you have to have a force. So what that force is. So this is the magnets. These are uh, steel bars. So what happens if I put them together? If I release hands, what did you see? Okay. Can you see? Yeah. They, they separate, separate from each other. This is due to uh, like pole repel. Uh, several years ago, there's uh, some, some work. They mapped those called black hole. They found that those axes aligned pretty well, aligned in the same directions. This is actually due to called the like pole repel. So that's magnetic portion is the cause of expanding of the universe. <laughs> there we go. Wow. Each of those little flying saucers just flying off the top. I see it. Wow. Okay. Did you see that one? Yeah. So what try to say, hey, we can use electromagnetic force attract. And now I'm just demonstrating electromagnetic force cannot repel. That's the force. So this is the force. I'm pushing the universe flying away from each other. Uh, what, what I try to say is uh, we we observe the expanding of the universe is not the only phenomenon we observed. We do see expanding part, but also we observed also something fly close to each other. So the universe, so in your view, is expanding and contracting in terms of... It. Yes. We we can observe both attraction and the repulsion. At a galactic level. Galaxies are... Some galactic galaxies level. Are, are pulling towards each other and some are repelling away from each other, right? That's right. But why, be, why, what is it, what evidence do they have that they have concluded that the universe in, in the standard view is overall accelerating away from itself? Whereas it sounds like with you, you're just saying, no, the 
parts that are accelerating away are just one part of looking at it. You can also see them, you know, contracting together in other places, like in, you said, Andromeda and Milky Way. Yes. Uh, uh, some uh, studies about 10 years ago, there was an article talking about uh, observed the galaxy. They, they tracking about 8,000, you know, uh, called cluster galaxies, not just galaxy. Each, cl- each cluster includes billions of galaxies, you know, right? A cluster galaxies, they find there is a called a great attraction point. So during that observation, they do find at the great attraction point, you will see something, they come together towards that point. However, you, un- you look at another direction, everything fly away from each other. So what I believe is the universe is really cycling and cycling. So expanding is a cycling from expanding and also attraction come together and and then ex- expanding again so in, in in this do you think this is happening symmet- do you think this is like symmetrically happening like this collectively or is it like a a blob in certain parts of it it's it's you know it's right here it's coming together and then over here it's repelling and uh, yeah, yeah. So these are phenomena that we do observe. You know, actually, uh, I believe in the early days, everybody believed everything's attracted towards each other. You know, the Hubble observed, hey, I saw everything's fly away from me. So that's why I create the Hubble's law, right? So, but based on the recent observations, we found that there are uh, acceleration from, from each other. And they are points, they are come attracting towards one point. So this are is you, the more modern views. Yeah. So you are you suggesting that the that like for Andromeda and Milky Way, for example, since that's our neighborhood, that they're right now in a period of accelerating towards each other, but at some point they're going to rotate or something and then repel away from each other like this. Oh, like, is that what oh. you're talking about? What are you saying here? Oh, okay. Um, I'm not going to pre- predict the future right now at this point. So we do see they are flying. Uh, toward each other, uh, you know, but uh, based on the, you know, based on the large year scale, you know, how many uh, millions of light years uh, to, to, so that could be changed because the whole universe is a dynamic phenomenon. Any uh, neighboring galaxies, neighboring uh, clusters of galaxies can change, right? So, uh, but the, the key point is we are not only observed everything's fly away from each other, like ex- accelerating, expanding on the universe. Because of before we discovered that, well, we find that everything fly towards each other before, right? Because we thought, hey, Newtonian force is the dominant force over this large distance, right? So basically, if we combine both of observations, I believe the universe is actually uh, in, in cycling, cyclical motion. Uh, but the key point, I don't want to lose the key point, the key point is why universe attract to each other due to magnetic attraction. And uh, somebody said, hey, can we say just gravitational? I said, if you say gravitational attraction, the gravitation does not have a repulsion. So why we, in the same time, we observe everything fly from each other? And the more simple answer will be magnet force can do both attraction and the repulsion. Yeah. Do you think does that, that makes the- sense? Yes. Do you think the galaxies are, you know, if the planets are are rotating in this centrifugal magnetic force yes. around the sun, and the yep. sun is rotating around the galaxy, do are the galaxies rotating around some center of the universe too, or no? Right. Oh yes, of course. A galaxy also a do revolution around the center of the cluster galaxy. So, so the clusters are, revo- are are theoretically making revolutions around something too. <laughs> yes, yes. Wow. So that's why that's why to measure the absolute motion of the earth of, of the earth is so difficult. Absolute motion because everything's in motion, right? It's stunning, isn't it? Yes. It is stunning. But there's a way called the gyroscope. Gyroscope can tell you the direction actually. Yeah. Itself. So what yeah. I'm trying to demonstrate is here. I have a, a CD disc, DVD disc, and put a, a Fidget spinner. There. Yeah. Um, I try to say when you have a physical spinning and this, uh, like a gyroscope, it can control direction. So I'm demonstrating hey, if I just leave it this way without the spinning, everything will fall, right? Right. So what happens if I wow. 
about. Did you see? Yes. So for the listening audience, this is a CD with a little, what is that spinner thing? And it's just it's a spinner. It, explain this for the for the audio audience, please, if you could. Oh, what I did is uh, I put a fidget spinner, glue the fidget spinner uh, to the center of a CD disc. And I put the CD disc vertical without spinning the fidget spinner. And uh, of course, you know, one side is heavier, right? So it will fall either way, without motion in the way. Right. But once I spinning the fidget spinner, what happens? It will keep the direction. So the disc will be always a vertical, 90 degrees to the table. Even though the disc on the one side has a fidget spinner, so it's not a, a symmetric, and the right. one, way, one place is heavier. But once it's spinning, it will remain in that direction. Uh, that's how we control space vehicle in space. If we're spinning one, it will keep the keep as our vertical to the uh, to the to one direction. But if we have two more fidget spinner, maintain in the x, y, z direction, so then we can control the things in space. So so that's how we we can hold this telescope focus on one point, uh, point to one direction in space. Even though the whole thing, so the, the Hubble telescope is orbiting the Earth, around the Earth, right, constantly. And the uh, James Webb uh, telescope is orbited the sun in this uh, solar orbit. However, we can always maintain uh, the lens point to one direction, even though the, everything else is in motion. We can make that way because we use the gyroscope. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I probably talk about it too far away from our origin point. Why anti-gravity is available? Okay, this is a very important point. I hope right. the audience don't blink, okay? Okay. So the so-called attraction-only force, that's called a Newtonian gravity, in my understanding, does not exist. The, the, the attraction force we observed in the universe is actually due to magnetic attraction. So that means since attraction we experience on Earth in the gravity or something, it's actual magnetic attraction. So and the magnetic attraction and the magnets and also can have a repulsion force. So that's why uh, we can make this as a UFO of a UAP type of phenomenon. Instead of pulling us together, it can repel us. And the higher attraction force, that means that we could make the, the bigger of the repulsion force. I, I don't want to miss the one point about uh, why I say everything we can do by gravitation attraction, we can make made by electromagnet, make things work. And we demonstrate that we can make things attract instead of use a magnetic force, I'm going to use an uh, electrical force. I use a, a device, uh, just a little bar, yeah. generate the static electricity on the surface of the bar. And then I put this one nearby empty uh, Coke can. Okay. And then what happens? I leave there about four inches away. And what happens if I turn it on? The can, it attracts the can. Then chasing away, chasing from the rod. So I move the rod away, and you will see the can is rotating on the floor, moving. So you just observed use a static uh, electrical bar can attract to the, the can, and the coke can, can attract them. So that's actually exactly attraction force between the sun. Sun generated like sun is not a static electric. Sun's surface due to thermonuclear reaction on the surface of sun is constantly uh, in motion, create a mo uh, moving um, plasma field that's created a giant electromagnetic field. So that magnetic field will be magnetized everything inside in the sphere of the solar system. And so, so that means everything becomes electromagnets now, right? Because being influenced by this, uh, this, uh, this giant magnetic field. And then when the sun rotates, when the star rotate at center, everything magnetizes them. It rotate with them. If only attraction force, it's not enough to rotate with them. It has to have a, both attraction and the repulsion, so pushing them to rotate with them. So basically, I try to 
emphasize again, the so-called Newtonian gravity does not exist. Everything we observed is actually called electromagnetic attraction. Magnetic can also repel. So that's why I believe we can turn this another way, becomes repel electromagnetic force. And I believe that's the force. That's, uh, that's called anti-gravity force. That's the force powering that's a U, UAP phenomena or UFO, UFO object. You know, it is just based on the structure of, of the matter. We, we were talking about the anti-gravity phenomena and people might ask, oh, are you only talk about this in theory? I said, no, actually we do have evidence of anti-gravity or anti-phenomena exist. One thing is there's a superconductivity. You would see under super cold, the superconducting material, which, it, which is not ma magnetic, you know, ferromagnetic material, right? Superconducting material and a very cold temperature and in a magnetic field. And it can flow, it can flow away. So that's called superconducting uh, phenomena. That's actually, that's called the electromagnetic phenomena. But, but I'm try, here I try to demonstrate a one at a room temperature and also demonstrate this anti-gravitational effect. Okay. So you have a demonstration to demonstrate room temperature magnetic repulsion. Yes. Wow. So how does that, wait, how do we, are we going to demonstrate, how does that fit to having actual local repulsion in, an, in a craft that people could even be in? That's a good question. I'm gonna make a make a demonstration uh, to say, hey, how two objects can repel each other. Okay. Here are magnets. Here are the magnets. Okay. I have some graphite material. I have different shapes of. And what happens if I put this one on top of this magnet? I hope the video can show you. And uh, so it is. It's flow. Is it spinning or just staying stationary when it's floating? Uh, it's not a spin. No. Okay. No, no spinning, no rotating, but it's just floating. And it's wobbling because of your hands and everything. Moving yeah, up. because of my hand. And I intentionally make the wobbly. Uh, so, so you know, they are not contact. Right? Yeah, it's not contacting. That's very a very cool demonstration. So that's room temperature demonstration of how physical objects at room temperature can repel. Yes. So I just wanted to say it's a so-called superconductivity. Um, it, it is a really magnetic phenomenon. It right. has been mis misinterpreted. You know, the superconducting material. Uh, the current interpretation is we have a zero electrical resistance. So that's why you can generate the electromagnetic force and make things floating uh, against each other. Actually, I, I told David several times before there was a, a superconductivity discovery in the past, over the past year or two. You know, there's two. I told them they are all magnetic phenomena. There's nothing uh, about uh, called a zero resistance. Um, like uh, everything uh, explained, the superconductivity is. So it is actually just electromagnetic phenomena. In room temperature, we can make non-magnetic materials and floating against, uh, you know, uh, floating on top of magnets against the gravitational force. But we want to go further. If we can control this device against not just the magnetic force from the uh, magnets, we can against the magnetic attraction from the Earth. So then we can have this anti-gravity propulsion available. I believe that's the future. So that's the whole purpose uh, of today. And is to demonstrate after 120 years from a Bright Brothers uh, successful experiment. And we try to make it one step further than regular uh, chemical propulsion or, or, or nuclear propulsion to travel space, we can make anti-gravity propulsion available for future uh, space travel. Very good. Dr. Yu, so when we look at this 
<clears throat> phenomena. Is this something that can, is there only, they always say there's more than one way to skin a cat or there's more pat, there's more than one way up the mountain. Do you believe that to create anti-gravity uh, devices, uh, objects that could hold the capacity for safe travel of humans? I'm just thinking even of cars, you know, how safer anti-gravity cars could be from, uh, you know, using gasoline. How many, how many car accidents involve the combustion engine, the you know, explosions, the fires, the fuels, the live fuel, different things like that. I think about airplanes and yes. how much of the cost of airplanes is the, you know, structure to maintain the, the weight of all that fuel, right? I think about, and the structure of the cabin as it relates to the unique aerodynamic thing, you could have a much more spacious and enjoyable cabin, cabin, <laughs> You know what I mean? A yeah. cheaper flight, right? Without any pollution, right? That's right. You know, one one big problem with the electrical vehicle right now is a safety concern. If you have a uh, accident, have a high speed impact, you know, the battery pack could becomes a uh, explosion, fire source, you know, burns yeah. you. So there, they do have a safety concern. But this electromagnetic propulsion, so untapped gravity propulsion, you do not cause explosion. Just like just magnet force repel each other. What that means, you can avoid impact. Instead of make you know uh, make the attraction the impact, you can suddenly turn anti magnetic uh, uh, mechanism. So the two objects become to repel each other. So then, so, car, so if an anti gravity car is coming at you, you trigger that anti gravity. Yeah, you, you yeah, you can track. So it becomes not it's not only just become a braking device. Braking means slow down, right? Instead of, okay. and then you can even oh, actually let them separate a distance from each other. I believe the safety feature and also um, because of a lack of moving parts, uh, you don't need to have a moving parts. Those structure, so that means much cheaper and much safer. I I do believe anti gravity propulsion will be our uh, long term solution for intergalactic travel. Right, it's no longer intercontinent; it's in, interplanet; it's intergalactic traveling possible, and I believe that is our future. That's fantastic. Is there? Uh... Looking at the uh, the the steps to getting there, is it only one way up the mountain, or is there multiple ways? Could you use sound to create magnetic repulsion? A sound to rely on medium, like atmosphere medium. We wanted something work in vacuum space, so sound alone may not be good, but the electromagnetic force yeah exists everywhere. I'm talking about, yeah, I'm saying, I'm so I'm still thinking of a car and a plane, replacing the car and the plane Ooh. first. I know you're already headed off to the stars. I'm still thinking about what can you do, what are some other uh, approaches to anti-gravity as it relates to life on Earth, you know, using, you know, using uh, cars and, 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 and you know, uh, planes. So how would you, if you're, if you're looking at it from that space, let's start with like the simplest Let's say you just want to have an anti-gravity car that's a passenger vehicle that's going to transport you and your family safely. Let's just start um, that low-hanging fruit there. Yes, so we can have a car instead of instead of using flying wings. So we, we can have a, just like a UFO, uh, UAP type of vehicle, yeah. right? Um, without consuming any uh, any external any, any fuels, we do not need to carry any fuels, and we do not need a track. Or called hyperloop tube, or, you know, build a hyperloop tube limited in that environment, and we can travel, uh, you know, even on the surface of Earth. Uh, what about rotation? And and does it require being, rotation, oh, or could the okay. object not be rotating? Uh, very good point. Uh, another anti gravity. So I I mentioned anti gravity phenomena with use the superconductivity phenomena. So we see that one. Another anti-gravity phenomenon is rotating. When things are rotating 50,000 RPM or even higher, you would observe the phenomenon of 
waste reduction. You know, you will see some reduced weight. So what the phenomenon, it basically is another way to, uh, to demonstrate anti-gravity available. Gravity is a magnetic attraction, right? A natural attraction. But when you're spinning something very fast, what happens? The positive and negative pole, okay? So they are so fast orbiting. So that, that may confuse the attraction part of the Earth or repulsion part. So that means, uh, so what we observe is, is weight less than previously. So I believe that's also is another demonstration called uh, anti-gravity should be available because when you're spinning positive and negative poles, they are rotating so fast and make it appear to be a floating something. So does the anti-gravity vehicle need that spinning effect or can it do it without spinning if it uses electromagnetic? Uh, that's a good question. We can have a physical spinning. So that's what we already observed. Objects spinning at a higher uh, RPM and the world demonstrated less weight than before. Or you can have rotational magnetic field. Or you just said, or we can spinning the mag electromagnetic field instead of physical optical spin. And then in that, in that sense, you have to see lights, spinning lights flashing, uh, you know, because whenever you electromagnetic field, uh, traveling field uh, in space, you always accompany with lights. Why? Because of that electromagnetic vibration. So, the, so the, those vibrations create a light. So that means that's another uh, evidence for me Whenever they observe it called the U, uh, UAP phenomena, UFO phenomena, always not only so this ship, of course, easy to spinning, right? It's more stable uh, physically, and also observe the light. Where comes the light? So that's from the electromagnetic field. So does emotion. does does an anti gravity uh, technology uh, vehicle? Does it require either spinning of physical spinning to to repel from Earth's magnetic attraction or the rotational magnetic field and that's it or can there be another way of creating magnetic propulsion from earth's magnetic field it's not necessarily needed if we just like we demonstrated this graphite you know on top of this one does not necessarily spin it can also anti gravity phenomena right but does a control but what i'm saying is does does a controllable transportation vehicle that is having an anti-gravity effect, does it have to be either physically rotating in a spin or rotational magnetic field to create magnetic controlled magnetic repulsion from the on the earth? Or is there another another potential pathway besides those two you've just demonstrated to create a, a transportation device that's controllable, not just the demonstrations you've done today? Uh to answer your questions, the first of the thing, uh do not have to have a physical spinning. So yeah, and but a ways of physical and we can use electromagnetic field spinning, right? Uh, one advantage about it, everything, anything spinning, the good things about it, if something's spinning, you have a better control of directions. So just like a gyroscope, it's so more stable. You're right. Yeah. So more just stable. like a helicopter, how you can get in and out wherever you want to. Yes. Be yes. This, yeah. this is right. a much 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 stable than a, yeah, than a that, plane. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. You explain. You know when the uh, the propeller in the in the in the helicopter spinning, you know it's a stable. The, the whole vehicle is much stable in that plane. You know, right? right. right. So yeah, it's a more stable. But if you're talking about, is there anything beyond? Uh, the, these things, uh, these tools. I, I believe it can have a combination uh, instead of beyond these two things. If you have a some or some better combination, you know, yeah. So instead something, of, and, and in your understanding of physics, in order to create magnetic repulsion at the, to the degree that you can control, because you can yes. do other things like superconductivity and those other demonstrate, but to have a controllable device that you're using and moving it's going to have to either physically spin or have a magnetic rotational field spinning or both, but you're, something's going to have to spin to create magnetic repulsion. Is that your conclusion? Oh, no, no, no. Not a, a spinning is not a necessary condition. It, it could, just like a demonstrator here, you do not spin, you can make it, they are repel each other. Right, but, you, but what I'm saying, but I'm saying a controllable device. That yes. A transportation yeah. 
within the paradigm of transportation, not just a stationary flotation thing, but in a transportation where you're controlling it, you're moving it wherever you want, does that type of magnetic repulsion transportation require spin of the physical kind or spin of the magnetic electromagnetic kind? Does it require one of those at least? And yes, yeah. it will require, uh, oh, uh, whether a spinning itself is a necessary part. Uh, not necessary. Not necessary. But uh, with the spinning, uh, it's more stable, uh, probably. It's more safe. Oh, okay, that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain the taxonomy of different mechanisms of anti-gravity as it relates to Earth. So there's the physical rotation of the object. That can create anti-gravity in a controlled transportation vehicle in and of itself. Then there's the electromagnetic rotation that the electromagnetic field rotation that can provide it. You can use those in conjunction. But then there's this third way that doesn't require spin. Static, yes. That's static just electric. electrostatic. Electrostatic. Are you a, are you repelling from Earth's uh, field or are you attracting to the ionosphere in that in that scenario or uh, both? I, you could I'm do both. About a, a repel Earth because Earth's gravity is bigger, right? So which of those three formats are the best way to create anti gravity? The most elegant, safest, you know, method. Uh, yeah, one thing is you 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 do not want a human being spinning. So that's going to make you dizzy, right? It's harmful for your health, for your body. So I would say uh, spinning electromagnetic field and also away from a human being. You have to shield the human being, right? When you have a rotating uh, electromagnetic field, you, you, know, you may generate the electro phenomena in the bodies, right? So you have to shield uh, people, human, from that kind of effect. Of course, uh, the, the the best way would be without any spinning and you can just flow anywhere, stay anywhere uh, you want it. Yeah. So that would be the simplest. And that would be the most, the, simple, the most comfortable for human beings to control. Would that be control. the hardest one to do engineering-wise? I, I believe so, yeah. Either, either, either we uh, have a lot of trial and error. Um, need some geniuses. To make to create those device, yeah. demonstrated, you know, with a human being in it, yeah. and can do can do those yeah. UFO phenomena. So that so, do you think it's one of those things that you first start with the rotational method and then you go to the electrostatic stable method, or do you or do you start with electrostatic with? Because like you said, if you're rotating around, that's not something you can control in a safe manner, probably, unless, could you have the centerpiece be, you know, not rotating and then the, the thing around, it's a ring that's rotating? Uh, so you have a stationary pod, yeah, if you like have a, a cockpit, and then you have a rotating object around it, that, it's that way? Oh, you don't of have to course, get... yeah. That could be, uh, uh, that could be a way. Instead of a human being, the pilot, you know, rotating, you can rotating a ring away from pilot or right? center the core. Uh, so that uh, one thing about the rotating uh, is a very important, probably the easiest to materialize of those. Phenomena. So when you're rotating, you will do not easier to flip, flip the pole. The, the vehicle, the object will not flip suddenly from repel. You flip, this suddenly becomes a track to crash each other, right? So yeah. you want to maintain the direct direction away from the Earth's gravity, right. Earth's, Earth's uh, attraction force. So yeah. I believe with some physical uh, physical spinning, uh, is much safer and much uh, stable. And of course, we, without causing dizziness or harmful to human body. And that's 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 using the the stationary cockpit with the rotating ring. Yes, yeah. we do have a spinning part make a vehicle much stable and much safer. Think about the third option you mentioned, the electrostatic model. Uh -huh. Seems like that would be, maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but maybe that would be more vulnerable to uh, disturbances around it. Environmentally. Exactly. Yes, yes. Is that yes. true? 
Yes, of course. If you anything in spinning, just like you ride a bicycle. If you sit still without moving the bicycle, you will fall. Yeah. Either way. If you, may, you ride a bicycle, the faster you ride, you know, the wheel spinning will keep you straight. Right. Right. So that would be the most thing. So that's why, yeah, that's good, good, good example. What about other forms of so-called anti-gravity? How about gas? So yeah, everything else we were not use, not called anti-gravity propulsion. Right. Anti-gravity propulsion means you use you reverse gravity. Right. Yeah. If you use any gas, you know, just basically use a chemical propulsion system, right? What about so, nuclear, some of those nuclear elements? Would they provide any type of anti-gravity power that has not been explored in this uh, discussion thus far? Yeah. I will not associate with uh, nuclear force with anti-gravity force. There's a gentleman that has uh, talked about a proposed new, you know, uh, new element who says that, that that was what was being used in the UFOs. There's NAP where they discussed element 115 or unum pentium where Lazar dismissed early findings surrounding element 115, stating that he was confident that further testing will produce an isotope from the element which will match his initial description. They made just a few atoms. We'll see what other isotopes they come up with. One of them or more will be stable, and it will have the exact properties that I said. And he's saying this is what was used in the UFOs that he was privy to when he was working for the government. Uh, the you know the nuclear fuel we use the 50 years you know on the uh, Voyager one and Voyager two so if they still rely on this kind of fuel um, it's not going to power power enough to make suddenly turns and accelerations uh, away from the object I do not believe that cause so but you could theoretically could you build a city size uh, anti gravity device to travel so you could take a whole city with you across to the, to the galaxy? It's it's a different, it's hard, but I would not say, I would not say you cannot, okay? Yeah. Well, Dr. Yu, I really appreciate your time. I think we've covered a lot, and uh, I really think that may the spirit of the Wright brothers and their voyage on that first flight 120 years ago guide those who would pioneer to the next to the next uh, paradigm of transportation and all of its different forms. Thank you for having me. I hope uh, the audience really can learn something you know, from our discussion. So thank you. For having thank me. you. And if you would like to be in touch with A Neighbor's Choice, you can email me hello at a neighbor's choice.com. That's hello at a neighbor's choice.com. I'm David Gronoski. Godspeed. Thank you.